All my life I wanted so badly to connect with people. But they couldn't understand because I had no way to communicate. I get to experience the world in a very unique way. I can see the wind, hear the flowers. I can feel incredible emotions flowing from those I love. This morning is James Bell, who had a death in his family, and our thoughts and prayers are with him. Today's meeting will be divided into three segments. Uh, Bruce will run the formal part of the meeting. Uh, after the formal part of the meeting is over, he'll adjourn, that, adjourn the meeting. For those of you that would uh, like to leave, you're welcome to leave. Uh, the second part of the meeting is I'll give you a brief summary of what's happened at Apple in the last year. And then in the third part of the meeting, uh, we'll be taking Q&A from the, from the audience. So with that, Bruce. Thanks very much, Tim. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Right. Forgive the formality. We have some business to get through, and then we'll get back to the Q&A. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that under the general rules of conduct for this meeting, the use of electronic devices, including phones, tablets, computers, and recording and photographic equipment is not permitted at any time in the meeting rooms. I will now call the formal part of the meeting to order. Let me introduce Pat Hayek and Alex Bender. Can one of these quickly stand up? From Ernst & Young, our independent public accounting firm, and Lisa Brenton. Raise your hand if you like to stand up. Hi. From Computer Share Trust Company, Apple Stock Registrar and Transfer Agent. Ms. Brenton is also serving today as the inspector of elections for this meeting. She has signed an oath of office, which is available for examination and will be filed with the minutes of the meeting. At this time, I would also like to ask the ushers to raise their hands and identify themselves. In the back, they'll be moving around throughout the, uh, throughout the meeting. The ushers will be assisting with the distribution and collection of materials during the meetings in this room and in the overflow rooms. The record date for this meeting was December 28, 2015. Only shareholders of record on that date are entitled to vote at this meeting. 
the notice of internet availability of proxy materials was first mailed to shareholders of record on January 6, 2016. The proxy card, the proxy statement, the annual report on Form 10-K for the fiscal year ended September 26, 2015, were first mailed on January 11, 2016 to each shareholder of record who requested a printed set of materials. Apple's transfer agent, ComputerShare, has provided an affidavit of mailing, which will be maintained with the minutes of the meeting. The number of shares of common stock entitled to vote at today's meeting is 5,544,487,000 shares. The Inspector of Elections has informed me, preliminarily, that shares representing more than 84% of the eligible shares are present at this meeting, either in person or by proxy. Accordingly, I hereby declare that a quorum is present, that the meeting is properly constituted, and that we may proceed with the business of the meeting. Let me briefly describe the voting procedures we will be using. We will follow the voting criteria and procedures described in our proxy statement, and will vote at this meeting only by ballot. If you have previously voted by proxy, you do not need to vote again at this meeting unless you wish to change your vote. If you are eligible to vote in person today and would like to do so, please raise your hand and a ballot will be brought to you by an usher. Please fill out the ballot legibly and sign it exactly as your shares are registered in the records of Apple Inc. If you are a beneficial owner of shares held in street name and you wish to vote in person today, please give your legal proxy and completed ballot to an usher. Please ensure that the name on your ballot matches the name on your legal proxy. So go ahead and if anybody wants a ballot, raise your hands now and we'll be able to save some time as we go through the ballot. Great. Please leave the usher will just circulate around and give them to you. Voting will follow the presentation and discussion of all of the proposals. After eligible shareholders have voted on all matters properly presented to the meeting, the polls will be closed and the ballots will be collected. The inspector of election will then evaluate voting eligibility for each ballot and tabulate the votes. I will report on the preliminary voting results at the close of the meeting. On the agenda today are four management proposals, four shareholder proposals, and such other matters as may properly come before the meeting. Each of the proposals has been described in our proxy materials. After each proposal is formally introduced, we will open the floor for questions and comments on that proposal only. During this formal portion of the meeting, please limit discussion to the specific proposals at issue. If time allows, we will have a general question and answer session after the official business of the formal part of the meeting has been con concluded. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. In the interests of orderly conduct and giving as many shareholders as possible an opportunity to be heard, please limit your comments to no more than two minutes. Let us now begin the formal business of the meeting. The first item on the agenda is the election of eight nominees to the Board of Directors. The nominees for election are James Bell, Tim Cook, Al Gore, Bob Iger, Andrea Jung, Art Levinson, Ron Sugar, and Sue Wagner. All nominees are currently members of the board. So I hear a motion for the election of these individuals to Apple's board of directors to serve until the next annual meeting of shareholders and until their successors are duly elected and qualified. Is that a motion? Thank you. Do I hear a second? Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Hearing none, I will declare that the discussion on this proposal is now closed. The next item on the agenda is a proposal for the ratification of the appointment of Ernst & Young as Apple's independent registered public accounting firm for 2016. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion or comment? <clears throat> Hearing none, I now declare that the discussion on this proposal is closed. The next item on the agenda is an advisory resolution to approve executive compensation. Do I hear a motion for the approval of this proposal? Thank you. A second? Second, thank you. Any question or comments? Hearing none, I now declare that the discussion on this proposal is closed. 
The next item on the agenda is a proposal to approve the amended and restated Apple Inc. 2014 employee stock plan. Do I hear a motion? Thank you. Seconded? Thank you. Any questions or comments on this proposal? Hearing none, I now declare that questions and comments on this proposal are closed. The next item on the agenda is a shareholder proposal entitled Net Zero Greenhouse Gas Emissions by 2030. Is there a shareholder representative to present this proposal? Thank you very much. The floor recognizes you. Yeah, we'll get your microphone. Good morning. My name is Christine Jans, president of Jans Management from Boston, Massachusetts. Jans Management is the beneficial owner of 1,350 shares of Apple Common Stock. And I'm here to ask for your support of proposal number five, a report on the goal of reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. In December last year, 196 parties at the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris signed an agreement to limit climate change to an average global warming of two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures with a goal of limiting it to 1.5 degrees Celsius, if possible. The agreement calls for net zero greenhouse gas emissions to be reached during the second half of the 21st century. By our estimations, Apple's current GHG reduction goals fail to address 80% of its GHG emissions. Much of these emissions come from the supply chain, which management has recognized as an area of concern. Our proposal requests that Apple report on a longer-term goal to reach net zero emissions over the next 15 years. Apple management asserts that the report requested here would be largely duplicative of Apple's existing public disclosures. However, Apple does not currently have a plan to address the vast emissions that come from its supply chain. Furthermore, Siemens, a major industrial firm, has already committed to being the world's first major industrial company to achieve a net zero carbon footprint by 2030. Furthermore, Siemens expects to demonstrate a bottom line benefit of annual savings of 20 million euro expected on a 100 million euro investment in improving energy efficiency. This illustrates the feasibility of the proposal's request. The recent Paris Agreement's aggressive targets to limit global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius is a more expeditious call to action than planned in Apple's current business goals. Scientists agree that reaching the Paris Agreement's goals means that the world must reach net zero GHG emissions much sooner than is currently planned by most corporations and nations. Apple is a leader in its commitment to the environment, but in order for the company to stay true to its environmental stewardship and to do its part to cut carbon emissions that will continue to raise global temperatures, the company must consider how its facilities can reach the status of net zero GHG emissions. Just as many corporations have delved into their supply chains to deal with significant issues, such as eliminating the use of palm oil as an ingredient in products they sell in order to mitigate negative environmental effects, we believe that it's appropriate for Apple to use its position to make changes in the GAG emissions of its major suppliers. In the interest of longer-term planning to affect significantly reduce GAG emissions, I urge you to vote for resolution number five. Thank you very much. Shareholder is moved for the adoption of this proposal. Are there any questions or comments? Hearing none, I declare that the discussion on this proposal is now closed. Let's move to the next item. The next item on the agenda is a shareholder proposal regarding diversity among our senior management and board of directors. Is there a shareholder representative here to present this proposal? Yes, sir, please. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Tony Maldonado. I'm the executive creative director of Insignia Entertainment. Diversity is a highly divisive and polarizing topic. It's not about quotas. It's not about replacing people who are underqualified, uh, under, underqualified people. So let's change the direction of the conversation to inclusion, or the gra great lack of inclusion within Apple. This means bringing everyone to consensus, to not exclude anyone from participating, and to not deny great opportunities to anyone irrespective of demographics. As the markets in the United States, Canada, Australia, and Europe mature and flatline, the new frontiers, the emerging markets, that's Latin America, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, those will provide us with opportunities to sell our wares and services to a varied and diverse 
population yearning to interconnect. This shall not be an easy task. In fact, monumental when you consider that so far nearly all the arguments deployed by Apple against this proposal for inclusive diversity within senior management and the board of directors have been depressingly short-term and insular. Further, hardly anyone voting against appears to be taking a broader, long-term, geostatistic view. Do we really think it wise to deny ourselves any further opportunity to shape and steer the destiny of our company by rejecting inclusive diversity amongst the most important group of our company, the decision makers. It's now vital that Apple drop its negative anti-inclusion reactionism and instead craft a new, positive, forward-looking identity if it's not to become an irrelevant entity like Motorola, Nokia, and others who were once great. We can't sit by the sidelines waiting another 10 or 20 years for change. The world is watching us. Ask yourselves, shall we relegate ourselves to nothingness? Or shall we push ourselves to think different, exactly as Apple has asked us for 40 years? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Shareholder has moved for proposal of, for adoption of this proposal. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Chair recognizes Reverend Jesse Jackson. Thank you, sir. We will comment more broadly in the Q and A. Ironically, Apple is already moving in this direction, and thus should be affirmed. The world is diverse. The market, the money the talent, the location, and the growth is diverse. So we should not position ourselves to react to inclusion, which leads to growth. When there's growth, everybody wins. And I would hope that those who reacted to the real language would reaffirm Apple's present direction. Your board is becoming more diverse. Your C-Street's more diverse. Your students are more diverse. The mark is more diverse. Please affirm uh, this positive direction. Thank you, sir. The proposal has been moved for adoption. Are there any other comments? <coughs> Hearing none, I declare that the discussion on this proposal is now closed. The next item on the agenda is a shareholder proposal entitled Human Rights Review, High Risk Regions. Is there a shareholder proponent to propose this? Yes, sir. Good morning. I'm Justin Danhoff of the National Center for Public Policy Research, and I rise to move proposal number seven. Last spring, our CEO penned an op-ed in the Washington Post in which he claimed that religious freedom restoration laws, quote, allow people to discriminate against their neighbors. He wrote that on behalf of Apple, I'm standing up to oppose this new wave of legislation wherever it emerges. Mr. Cook was speaking on behalf of this company, and I'm sorry to say he wasn't telling the truth. The federal government and 31 states have religious freedom laws. This is what they do. First, they say that the government should not interfere with an individual's religious freedom unless doing so is necessary to reach an important government goal. Second, they say if the government can reach this important goal in a way that does not abridge religious freedom, it should choose that other method. That's all these laws do. The federal religious freedom restoration law was co-authored by Senator Ted Kennedy and signed into law by President Clinton. Its purpose is to protect religious rights, which are of course civil rights. The state laws imitate the federal law. Mr. Cook's op-ed called the Kennedy-Clinton laws dangerous, comparing them to the days of whites-only signs on water fountains and other forms of discrimination. Never mind that the laws only require the government to avoid interfering with the religious freedom if it can do so while still achieving important government goals. One of which, of course, in every state in the union, is outlawing discrimination. Mr. Cook said he wrote this op-ed on Apple's behalf in, quote, the hopes that many more will join the movement. Our proposal takes Mr. Cook up on this. 
Apple currently operates in 17 nations where homosexuality is outlawed. In four of those countries, homosexual acts are punishable by death. Women have almost no rights in numerous countries in which Apple does business, and just try getting a fair trial in many of these nations. Let us, as shareholders of Apple, join this movement, as Mr. Cook said, and question why Apple is operating in nations where doing so requires Apple to discriminate and to acquiesce in discrimination. Could a woman even drive a shipment of iPhones to an Apple sales location in Saudi Arabia or work in a store without the permission of a male relative? Our proposal simply asked management to prepare a report identifying Apple's criteria for operating in regions with significant and systematic human rights violations. As Mr. Cook himself wrote, opposing discrimination takes courage. With the lives and dignity of so many people at, take, at stake, it's time for us to be courageous. Please join me in supporting Proposal 7. The shareholders move for adoption of the proposal. Do I hear any other questions or comments? Hearing none, I declare the discussion on this proposal is closed. Proposal 8 is the next item on the agenda. This is entitled Shareholder Proxy Access. Is there a shareholder representative to present this proposal? Thank you. Hello, I'm Jim McRitchie from corpgov.net, also representing John Harrington of Harrington Investments. Apple's opposition statement cites Pat McGurn of ISS, who said, since Apple adopted proxy access, other boards are, quote, likely to examine this issue now. Yes, Apple's proxy access got lots of press. That doesn't mean that ISS supported it as the opposition statement implies. In fact, they support our proposal. Here's just two reasons why Apple's proxy access is mostly a figment of the imagination, like BP's old uh, Beyond Petroleum PR campaign. Number one, Apple's bylaws impose a 20 Mem member limit on the number of investors that can form a nominating group. Both ISS and CII, the Council of Institutional Investors, oppose caps. The Council of Institutional Investors represents members with about $3 trillion worth of investments. CII says that even if the 20 largest public pension funds joined together, they wouldn't hold the required 3% of stock for three years at most companies. And that's especially true at Apple, where 3% is $16 billion. OK, here's the second reason. Apple's bylaws limit shareholder nominees to 20% of the board, rounded down. Apple has eight directors, so that means one director, one nominee. Both. ISS and CII favor 25%, not 20%. 25% at Apple would mean two nominees. Now, Apple has three committees. No director right now serves on more than two committees. So one director nominee wouldn't even be able to cover the committees that Apple has. And also, generally, it takes two people to get a discussion going, one to make a motion and another one to second the motion. Costco shareholders recently passed a similar proposal on proxy access by a vote of 65%. Deer shareholders did so on Wednesday. And every fund that has announced their vote in advance of this meeting has voted in favor of this proposal. And this is teacher pension funds from Canada to Texas to California, public pension funds from Florida to Australia, as well as a bunch of mutual funds and religious funds. Please vote in support of item eight on your proxy to provide genuine proxy access to long-term Apple shareholders. Thank you. Shareholders have moved for proposal of this uh, for adoption of this proposal, are there any comments or questions? Hearing none, I declare that the discussion period for this proposal is closed. This concludes the introduction of all the proposals to be presented at this meeting. 
Apple's bylaws require advance notice of any business to be brought before this meeting. We have not received advance notice of any other matters. The polls are now open. We will now vote on the proposals. If you are voting in person today, please mark your ballot accordingly. Again, if you have already voted by proxy, you do not need to vote now unless you wish to change your vote. Please raise your hand again if you need a ballot. Good. We ask that all shareholders of record who voted by ballot please pass their completed ballots to the ushers who will be present and passing through the auditorium and in the overflow rooms. If you are a beneficial owner of shares held in street name, please pass your legal proxy and the completed ballot to the ushers. Please ensure that the name on your ballot matches the name on your legal proxy. Wait a minute or so to start. are now closed. I will now announce preliminary voting results based on proxies we re received prior to the start of this meeting. As I present the preliminary results, we will show the approximate percentage of shares voted for and against. For simplicity, we will not include abstentions or broker non-votes. Final voting results will be published in a current report on Form 8K. The 8K will contain the certified numbers of votes for and against, as well as abstention and broker non-votes for each of the proposals. Proposal number one is the election of eight nominees to the Board of Directors. According to these preliminary results, each of the eight nominees to the Board of Directors has been elected by the required vote. Proposal number two to ratify the appointment of Ernst & Young as our independent auditors for 2016 was approved with 99.59% voting for the proposal and 0.41% voting against the proposal. Proposal number three, an advisory vote on Apple's executive compensation was approved with 95.16% voting for the proposal and 4.84% voting against the proposal. Proposal number four, to approve the amended and related and restated Apple 2014 employee stock plan was approved with 95.01% voting for the proposal and 4.99% voting against the proposal. Proposal number five, a shareholder proposal entitled Net Zero Greenhouse Gas Emissions by 2030 was not approved, with 7.14% voting for the proposal and 92.86% voting against the proposal. Proposal number six, a shareholder proposal regarding diversity among our senior management and board of directors was not approved, with 5.14% voting for the proposal and 94.86% voting against the proposal. Proposal number seven, a shareholder proposal entitled Human Rights Review, High Risk Regions, was not approved, with 1.76% voting for the proposal and 98.24% voting against the proposal. Proposal number eight, a shareholder proposal entitled Shareholder Proxy Access, was not approved, with 32.60% voting for the proposal and 67.40% voting against the proposal. In just a moment, Tim Cook, Apple's Chief Executive Officer, will be back on stage to provide you with an update on the past year and to answer your questions. Again, I would like to request that you please abide by the rules of conduct established for this meeting. If you want to ask a question during the Q&A session, 
please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. If you are watching this meeting in an overflow room, please submit your name and question using one of the iPads available from the ushers. We ask that you limit your comments or questions to no more than two minutes in total so that other shareholders will have the opportunity to participate. Let me close by thanking all of our shareholders who are present here today as well as those who participated by proxy. So now, before we move to the question and answer period, do I hear a motion for adjournment of the formal part of Apple's 2016 annual shareholders meeting? So moved. Seconded? Second. Thank you very much. Formal part of the meeting is hereby adjourned. I never like to stand behind podiums, so I'm just going to use a stool if you can sit behind. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about 2015 and uh, give you an update of what's going on in Apple. Uh, we, we had an incredible year in, in 2015. We launched all new versions of both our mobile and our desktop operating systems. And just five months after we launched iOS 7, or iOS 9 rather, we had 77% of the active devices uh, using this, our most advanced and secure operating system. This is incredible when you think about it. Uh, OS 10 El Capitan for Mac also has uh, brought much faster performance to the Mac and, and lots of new features and is being well received. Uh, we made the best smartphones in the world even better with the iPhone 6S and the 6S Plus with great new innovations like 3D Touch and Live Photos. If you haven't tried these, I'd encourage you to, to, to check them out. You may have seen some of the amazing World Gallery photos from some of our customers that were streaming uh, as you were coming into the meeting this morning. Uh, some really spectacular photos. Maybe one day I can take one that good. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can joke about ourselves. Uh, I'm also very excited about the iPad Pro, uh, which lets you be more creative and more productive on a whole new scale. And the Apple Pencil is opening up a whole new world of creative possibilities. We reinvented the notebook with the all-new MacBook. And we introduced the all-new Apple TV, which is laying the foundation for the future of TV. We also launched the Apple Watch. And I am still receiving an enormous number of emails from customers about how the watch has helped them be more fit, to lose weight, and in some cases even discover that they have some heart conditions. Uh, in June, we introduced Apple Music. And we're really uh, happy to have over 11 million paying subscribers just five months after the paid service went, went live. It's got a great, great future ahead of it. In addition to launching uh, uh, all these great products and services, we reached some major milestones in the company last year as well. Our install base of actively used devices crossed one billion for the first time. This is huge. <laughs> In addition, our uh, install base is driving a very large and fast-growing services business that generated over $33 billion in purchases in the last four quarters, including over $20 billion from the App Store alone. Uh, Apple Pay also continues to gain traction, and I hope that, that many of you are using it. Uh, customers have now spent billions of dollars using it, and more merchants are accepting Apple Pay every day. The Apple Pay is available in the, the United States, in the UK, in Canada, and Australia. And we're very happy that last week Apple Pay went live in China. Our business results in uh, calendar two, uh, 2015 were our best ever. Uh, and the numbers are, are pretty mind-boggling. We sold 232 million iPhones, 50 million iPads, 20 million max. We generated 235 billion in revenues, and we generated uh, some profit, uh, 54 billion in profit. Uh, we also continue to expand our global footprint in the world. We opened uh, 22 new Apple retail stores, including uh, in, and including the five we've opened this calendar year. We're now at 474 stores in 17 countries. We've got 33 stores in Greater China 
and we're on track to hit our goal of having 40 by the middle of this year. Uh, we generated last year $61 billion of revenue in Greater China uh, in, just the, in just four quarters, which was more than any U.S. company. And today, over one-third of Apple's revenues comes from the emerging markets, and we're seeking to further expand that because we see significant opportunities in several countries, including India. Uh, we're making very significant investments in our business because we're very bullish on Apple's future. Uh, we spent $8.5 billion last year in research and development on new products and services and, and core technologies. Some of these, uh, you could see the, the, the pro in the products, and, but many of these are for the future, and, and uh, we're not opening those doors to you today. <laughs> uh, we also completed 19 acquisitions in the last five quarters. We usually do this quietly, or, or at least attempt to, uh, and we're always on the look lookout for companies with really great technology and great people and that, that would fit into Apple, and we continue to seek those. And in the times where equity values are falling, uh, it, there's even more opportunities to do that. Uh, most importantly, we continue to invest in our most important asset, which, which is our people. Uh, they are the most important part of Apple by far. We, we now have 116,000 employees around the world. Customers love their iPhones, the loyalty rates are off the charts, and we are seeing unprecedented switching rates from, from Android, and we are welcoming those customers with open arms. Uh, so because of all this that's going on, uh, we're very bullish about Apple's future. Uh, we are continuing on our unprecedented $200 billion capital return program uh, to our shareholders, we're now at $153 billion through that, through the end of last quarter. Uh, we returned uh, to shareholders $50 billion in calendar 2015 alone, uh, and we're committed to increasing the dividend annually, which I know is important to a number of you. Um, we will update our capital return program in April on our yearly cadence. <laughs> And while making products that empower people and enrich, enrich people's lives is what we are focused on, we are also undertaking important work in a number of areas to advance education and diversity, the environment, and human rights. And I'd like to spend just a moment on those. We believe that education is the great equalizer for people, and that technology can play a key role in that. And we're continuing our efforts to teach coding both in our retail stores and partnering with administration in a program called Connect Ed to reach some of the most underprivileged schools in the, in the United States. And uh, it's, it's a, thr a thrill of my life to go out and see some of these. Uh, we're also working with some of the America's historically black colleges and universities, uh, in particular the Thurgood Marshall <coughs> Scholars, and we have a number of these kids that are visiting us for this week and are probably getting quite an indoctrination into Apple this week. Uh, I think we have two in the audience here somewhere. Mulek Jones, yes, <laughs> glad you guys are here. And Sunetta Tyler, thank you guys for joining us. Um, <laughs> we have a multi-year partnership with the Third Good Marshall uh, Fund and uh, we're looking forward to uh, many long years together, and, and, and obviously that will help Apple and diversity as well. Diversity continues to be an area that we are deeply committed to, and we firmly believe that inclusion inspires innovation, uh, and that the most successful companies of the future will be the most diverse. We're very pleased that our board of directors is more diverse than ever before, and significantly better than our Fortune 500 uh, company counterparts. Uh, but there's much more work to do on diversity across the company, and I can uh, commit to you that we are working very hard on it. Uh, another topic I'd like to spend a moment on is equality and equal pay. We've done a very comprehensive study of our U.S. salaries over the past year, 
And we found that women earn today 99 points, and, and we, we do this to decimals and not round because we're an engineering company, 99.6 cents for every dollar men earn in similar roles, and underrepresented my, minorities earn 99.7 cents for every dollar that white employees earn in similar roles. We do this study once a year. And, uh, and while we're encouraged that the discrepancies were so small, we've obviously taken action to address them in our compensation processes so that every uh, employee at Apple knows that they're being paid fairly. And we hope that other companies will follow this trend. Turning to the environment for a minute, we're deeply proud of our leadership in leaving the planet better than we found it. Our goal is to run all of our operations on renewable energy, and I'm happy to tell you that 100% of our U.S. operations are run on renewable energy. Mm. Also, well over 87% of our global operations have achieved that as well, and we won't stop until we get to 100 as uh, someone mentioned earlier, we have turned our attention to the supply chain. We're now working with our supply chain to move them to 100% renewable energy. And we've made quite, quite a dent in it so far, but we have much further to go. Uh, in China, we're expanding our, our clean energy investments, which will deliver over 2 gigawatts of new clean energy in the coming years. To put that in perspective, that's the equivalent of taking nearly 4 million passenger vehicles off the road for a year. So this is a, a serious improvement. Uh, we also continue to focus on raising standards at our supplier partners, and Jeff and his team have done just a remarkable job, and in the next couple of weeks we'll be put, uh, publishing our latest supplier responsibility report. Uh, to give you a little bit of what's going to be in there, is last year we trained 2.3 million workers on their rights, and we've now trained over 9 million since 2008. Finally, we are a staunch advocate for our customers' privacy and personal safety, and we've been in the news a bit about that, and some of you may have some, <laughs> some, of you may have some questions on that. <laughs> because these are the right things to do. And uh, being hard doesn't scare us. Uh, so in summary, we couldn't be more confident with where Apple is today, and I can tell you I'm incredibly <coughs> proud uh, to be working at this company at this time with the most unbelievable people in the world. And I want to thank the board uh, who have helped the management team in the, in the, in the company, uh, many of them over many years. And so with that, I'd like to uh, open it up for questions. I will call on you so you don't have to line up. And uh, let's start right over here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Cindy Cohen, and I'm the executive director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a member-supported nonprofit organization that's been advocating for civil liberties in the digital world for over 25 years. I don't have a question, but I would like to make a short statement in support of Apple's leadership in fighting for security and privacy of its customers against the FBI. At EFF, we represent the interests of users of digital devices who need security, privacy, and protection from hackers, malware, and overbroad government surveillance. We also represent the interests of technology creators who seek to build secure technologies and a technology infrastructure that all of us can trust. Since the 1990s, we have led the fight against government attempts to limit strong encryption, and I personally led the first lawsuit on this issue. We all know how fast technology moves, and for us at EFF, this has meant remaining vigilant and focused on protecting users' rights for strong security on the devices that we all increasingly rely upon. We were so pleased that Apple saw that providing uncompromised device security to its customers made good business sense. Its actions in introducing default encryption in iOS 8 and then strengthening it with iOS 9 single-handedly increased the security enjoyed by hundreds of millions of people all around the world. Because of this, Apple's strong stance here against the FBI's attempt to force it to attack its own devices is incredibly important. 
We have long warned that the FBI seeks to undermine the security for technology users and have been warning that a showdown like this was coming. Make no mistake, all of us have our security at stake here. There is no reliable way to build a pathway to undermine Apple's security that will only let in the good guys. And once it has built this path, there is no way that the law will limit Apple to using it only on a single phone. Mm -hmm. Neither technology nor law supports this. As security expert Bruce Schneier has said, either we all have security or none of us do. So we were pleased to see Apple take this stand to protect the security and privacy of its customers. We are supporting Apple publicly and will be filing a friend of the court brief siding with them because it's wrong for the government to conscript Apple or any company or any coder to write and certify brand new code that they believe, rightly, will undermine the security that we all need to trust. This is about all of our safety and it's about resisting government overreach. These are hard battles to fight. We know we've been fighting them for many years. We're proud of Apple for supporting strong encryption which at its heart is supporting civil liberties. And we're proud to stand with you in this fight. Thank you. <laughs> Reverend Jackson, would you like to say a few words? Yes. Well, we want to appeal to you in this critical hour did not grow weary in well-doing. Where we stand in terms of controversy is a measure of our character. Some leaders only follow opinion polls, others stand up to their principles, refuse to compromise and mold opinion. We have such a leader in you, Tim. You're a man of integrity and character. We applaud your leadership. Yes, we all oppose terrorism, terrorism, both domestic and global. We mourn the loss of life from the deadly assault unfolded in San Bernardino. There is this tension between freedom and fear, courage and cowardice at the crucible of the cross. But we oppose the unprecedented government overreach that threatens the civil liberties of all Americans and all world citizens. See fresh in many people's minds is the illegal surveillance and collection of private information about American citizens, provided by major tech and telecom companies to the National Security Agency. And I recall the FBI Watap and Dr. King and the Civil Rights and Black Movements and Dr. King and Chavez and other organizations. And recently the surveillance of the act of the Rainbow Push Coalition and Black Lives Matter. We cannot go down this path again. Some of us do remember the days of, of Hoover and McCarthy and Nixon and enemies list. As I watched the debate last night, to think that one of those men <laughs> was a heartbeat away from being America's next president <laughs> and, could, and could convene the FBI uh, and the CIA uh, and the Attorney General and divulge the enemies list, with your cooperation, it would be held to play. We deserve better, and we thank you for standing up, sir. We must find the path that protects personal freedoms and privacy, respects both civil liberties and the needs of law enforcement and national security. I want to express uh, all, all of us to give a special uh, moment of prayer for James Bell's mother who died this past week. He's not here. I wish we had a moment of silence for board member James Bell. Amen. Amen. James Bell, an uh, unbelievable, the talented man from the board of J.P. Chase, was correct, was the COO of Boeing, and now on this board is a net value to the board. I want to thank you for the unprecedented $40 million gift invested in the Thurgood Marshall uh, scholarships. Two of the youth are here today. One of them is from North Carolina A&T. That's a step above Al Gore and Fisk, I think. <laughs> <laughs> a step above what? I couldn't understand. Why is committee from Fisk? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's inside the treaty. <laughs> I want to thank you for your leadership in the workforce diversity area and the third U.S. debt offering for the third consecutive time for black and brown uh, uh, financial managers. Uh, my question is, can we provide a breakdown of Apple spend specifically with black and Latino companies? When we raised this issue some time ago, you vowed to take the leadership and to put a, an esteemed woman like Lisa Jackson in the C-suite. It's a brilliant woman, former head of EPA. Uh, Smith, where is she? I just want to give kudos for I'm giving kudos. Miss Smith, please stand. Give her a hand. Get up, girl. Where is she? I don't care. I guess the real point is I'm concerned that the wording of that diversity the proposal may have been confused. I would hate I would like I would hate to think that ninety percent of us are against the diverse proposal unless we got some hidden Trumpism in the room. Uh, really, we're better than that. The, the whole, as Apple becomes more global, uh, half of all human beings are Asian, half of them are Chinese. When they eat the rulers, the African one-fourth Nigerian, we're 6% of the world's population, and the Soviet Union, the former Union, is 6%. Two-thirds of our neighbors uh, speak Spanish. Most people in the world are yellow, or brown, black, non-Christian, poor, female, young, and don't speak English. In that world, <laughs> Apple must thrive. It must be reflected vertically and horizontally and emotionally. <clears throat> and we level again, Tim, uh, we realize the pressure we've been under. Uh, but when relatively good guys seek to stop terror, uh, there's a sense that maybe we can take a pass. But the good guys are not in power all the time. And the idea that somebody could have an enemy's list uh, and subpoena you and unveil our records is too much, is too un-American. We all deserve better. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My question or statement is not so high-minded. It's much more mundane. There are uh, no I, mundane questions. <laughs> I come from this, to this question from two places. Uh, I worked in the Apple Red Zone as an expert for six and a half years. Um, I'm probably the oldest expert in Apple. <laughs> and I come from an advertising background, working as a copywriter and marketing writer for Ogilvy and Mather, Young and Rubicum, and the Wall Street Journal. Okay, so I tell you this because one of the things that concerns me is we are looking to increase Apple's presence in business. And yet you walk into an Apple store and there is nothing there that says, we want you to buy our products and use them in our business. If the specialists remember, they will bring up to the customer we have a business team. Can we help you in your business? But they don't always remember that because the and the turnover in the red zone is very great. What's the red zone? Secondly, the customers that I do talk to who would like to use Apple products but can't is because there is not enough software being written for Apple products. So what I'm asking you is A. Is there a way that we can bring some kind of informational material by way of signs on, on some of the uh, screens uh, to tell people when they walk in, hey, we want our products in your business? And two, what are you doing with software developers to make sure that they write software for Apple products? Thank you for the question. I'm going to have Angela talk about uh, business awareness in the store, and then I'll talk about uh, more of the enterprise sales and getting uh, developers to write programs for, the, for Apple. Angela? Thanks, Tim. Um, 
Angela runs all of retail and all of online, and she's fantastic. We are very fortunate. <laughs> Thank you for bringing business up because it is a huge focus for retail. Um, I think Tim has made it known to the world the larger um, enterprises that the company is working with, with a partnership with IBM and Cisco and Microsoft. Um, but our challenge is in the 474 stores, the communities all over the world, what is our role for all of those small and medium sized businesses? And it is not a small undertaking because we know in every single community that 95% of the businesses in that community are small and medium sized. We also know that they have less than 10, employ 10 employees in that company. So it is massive, and it is far beyond 100 business people around the world. So we are challenging 65,000 retail employees around the world to own business. It's more than a sign. It's a mission. It's about 8% of the retail business today. We have goals to make it, just like the corporation, a huge part of the business. There are massive things that we're doing. Um, too many to list today, but thank you for bringing it to our attention, and we're very focused on it. On the enterprise side, uh, last year with, uh, with the work we've done with IBM, there's now a hundred, over a hundred apps written for particular jobs and particular enterprises, and this is this year is the year to scale that in a big way. Uh, also, this year you'll see the first fruits of the Cisco uh, work, which essentially allows iOS traffic to run faster through the enterprise. Uh, which I think will be really great. Uh, it'll also allow the iPhone to be integrated into the company telephony systems and so forth, and that is for both small business and, and enterprise. So we've got some great things going. Last year, our revenues for, from enterprise were about $25 billion, uh, up 40% year on year, and so enterprise is one of the fastest growing uh, areas that, that we have in the company at this point. And I, and I think there's just huge opportunity for enterprise. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tim. Uh, it's wonderful to get a chance to get back into this annual meeting after having to sit in the overflow room for the last couple of years. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ho hopefully we're going to have a larger room soon. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lovely lady on your staff named Heather that uh, saw me uh, and heard me talk about being in the overflow room in the last couple of years and probably 20 levels removed from you felt unable to help me get into this room. So thank you for building thank a company you. that cares about every single one of us. Thank you for standing up for our values that we ourselves sometimes forget to realize are so easily trampled on. Thank you for supporting your employees to do their best work, make a difference by making charitable contributions, enabling volunteer time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Heather and the rest of your team really show why you do the work you do, especially demonstrated with the video um, about the child with disabilities and, the, and enabling folks like them to participate in our world. Shows why I love Apple. Um, so two questions. Um, could you find a way before the new campus is built and before it becomes full <laughs> for the next meeting to enable people in the overflow room to actually get their questions asked and answered? Or number two, find a way to maybe take questions ahead of time uh, in some way. Uh, I've got some questions here on the iPad that I'm going to next, and hopefully I'll hit some of those. But yeah, we'll look at a we'll look at a different way of doing it. And when we do get to the new site, the auditorium is larger, and so I'm I'm hoping we'll be able to fit most people into the to that space. Okay. And then my last question is: older hardware and newer OS. Uh, several years ago, this was a, an issue where People with older hardware, when they upgraded either iOS or macOS, would suffer performance issues. And several times you folks made differences to, to not have that be a problem. It seems like in the last year or two, that's become a bigger problem. And, and it just forces us to be completely unable to go backwards, especially on iOS. Craig, you want to comment on that? Yes, so we have microphones on there. <clears throat> I, uh, great question. Uh, so 
we put a lot of uh, focus on this, especially over the last year, on making sure that uh, we continue to invest on making past platforms work uh, better. We put work, uh, for instance, in OS 10 on things like memory compression that would allow us to run well even on systems that may not be up to today's uh, specs. We put a lot of efficiency work into OS 10. Uh, and iOS, a huge focus for us was making sure that <coughs> iOS 9 uh, worked better than iOS 8 on existing devices, even when we extended support for another year back. If you, you may have noticed when we released iOS 9 in the past, we would have de-supported um, the oldest generation of hardware. We actually held on to supporting those for another year. Uh, and this is tremendously important for us because we wanted to make sure that all of those devices got uh, an upgrade with all of the security protections. One of the big reasons that we don't support a, uh, a rollback mechanism on iOS where a customer would uh, take an OS and then decide to run an older OS is that's exactly a, a, a vector for an attacker to roll back security protections on your device and then exploit them. And so the fact we move our customers forward with, uh, with upgrades and make sure they're always running the latest operating system is a massive part of how we protect users. Um, but I absolutely appreciate your, your question, and we will continue to put all our energies into making our devices run well. Thank you. And going to the iPad, I got a question. Um, how concerned are you about China and its economy and Apple's reliance on this market? <clears throat> uh, last year, uh, we had an unbelievable year in China, uh, 60 billion in revenues. Uh, it's hard to, there's, there's no adjectives that describe how, how really great it is. And at the root of that, there are two things. One is uh, people love our products, and that's the most important thing. And then the, se the second thing is that there's a huge move happening in China where uh, 50 million people were in the middle class five years ago, and there will be a half a billion in the middle class five years from now. And so I know there's a lot in the news every day about uh, the economy in China and weakness in China and so on and so forth. If you sort of block the noise out and keep those numbers in mind, China is a huge, huge opportunity for us and, and anyone else that's in the consumer, uh, consumer markets. And so we are a big believer in China uh, from a market point of view, from a skill point of view. We have... Uh, the most iOS developers uh, of any place in the world are in China. And uh, so the, there's uh, incredible opportunity there. And I don't know how each quarter will look. There will be some potholes and so forth along the way. But if you're in this for the long term, as, as we are, I think China is a supermarket. La last quarter, so more, a little closer to uh, today, Four of the five top-selling smartphones in China were iPhones, including number one, which was the iPhone 6S. And so um, we're seeing a, a fair amount of success there, and, and I do believe it will continue to be a really key market. There was a question over here. Yes. Uh, we'll bring a, a mic to you. Good morning, Tim. My Good morning. So great. Um, I'm from Boston. Um, Thanks for coming a long way. Thank you. Uh, uh, my question was on the last conference call with uh, analysts. You yeah. talked about your services business and how fast it was growing, and how the investment community and uh, and analysts should put more fo focus on it. So my question to you was, uh, if you look at uh, some of the latest services or some of the services that you have launched, they've had a rough start, to say the least. And uh, uh, per uh, personally for me, I had uh, Beats Music. I transferred my music to Apple Music. I lost all of it. And uh, I, could not get, I could not get any of my music back. You look at iCloud, uh, it's, uh, it's frustrating. It's a confusing product to use. So uh, what are you doing? Uh, to uh, to shift the investment community's uh, idea from mainly valuing your business as a hardware business and, and not as a services a platform. Well, one, if, if you have any problems, we want to fix the problems. And so we, we ought to get somebody, we'll get somebody to talk to you up to the end of the meeting, and I'd, I'd like to get those done. In terms of your last question about what are we doing to shift, 
we felt that, that the first thing we had to do was to illuminate it because the, as you know from looking at our results, the um, services area was sort of hidden in, in some ways because the, the, way that, the way that we uh, account for things in services revenue is if an app store sells at a dollar, uh, generally speaking, uh, we get 30 cents, the developer gets 70. That 30 cents covers the huge cost of running the app store and uh, marketing and, and engineering and, and all of that. We only book the 30. And so one thing that we wanted to do was to, to show people the real size of this thing. And so we went to a uh, concept that I, I, I think we called purchases, basically, but it's the total. So people could see the true size and, and scale of it. The next thing we did was to show the growth rate of it. And uh, the numbers off the top of my head were um, uh, 9 billion for Q1 growing at 23, 24%, right? And so that's just for one quarter, right? And huge growth rate. And we also made comments, although we didn't do the P&L all the way down to the, to the contribution margin level, but we made comments about what the gross margin looked like. And so that's our first step. People don't change their view in a day, as you know. It takes a while. But I feel like we've laid the foundation for that and uh, made people aware that it's something we're very focused on and that, in addition, we have over a billion active devices out there that uh, is the best customers in the world using, using the devices. And so uh, to the degree that we have great services, it, it would seem to be a huge opportunity for Apple uh, over, the, over time. Already is, frankly, <laughs> even, even more over time. So you can count on us continuing to talk about this and continuing to illuminate it. Uh, in, in fact, if you just took our services business on its own, it would be one of the largest services, services businesses in the world. Uh, let me go back to the iPad here to, to keep people engaged and in the other room. Um, and I don't know if it's 10 o'clock yet, but I'm supposed to end at 10. So keep... You're cutting me off? Uh, I saw I was getting the... the can you update us on investments in India? Will it be the next China for Apple? India is a very interesting market for us. Our revenues in India, where I told you China is about 60, last year India was about one and a half, a little less than one and a half. So the, the level of difference is enormous between the two at this point. Why is that? There's lots of complexities about how you go to market in India. But some of the biggest obstacles for us is there's no LTE there right now. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine if you are uh, using your iPhone for video, as most of us do every day, it's kind of tough. It's tough sledding without LTE. So that's one. There's an infrastructural uh, uh, brittleness there. But I'm convinced with uh, Prime Minister Modi that that's going to get fixed and get fixed in, in uh, pretty fairly quickly. And the population in India, in some ways, is uh, <clears throat> some of the best in the world. Half the people in India are less than 25. Think about that. And so there's a huge amount of young people moving up to the ranks, and, uh, and the sort of the consumer uh, will rise up there as they've risen in every other country in the world. And so we want to be there and understand the market well, and so we are putting a great deal of investment. At some point, Angela will go into India. We, we don't have a specific date on that yet, but we're, we're diverting more and more of our attention there because we see India basically as where China was 10 years ago. And if you think back to the, to the incredible growth that there's been in China over the last 10 years, that suggests that India is a really large opportunity. So I can take one more question. Uh, wow. <laughs> let me say this. I, um, let me say this. If I don't call on you, just send me a message. Is it easy? 
tcook at apple.com. I'm, I'm surprised you didn't know it. It seems like everybody else in the world knows. <laughs> but, but despite the Under Armour hat, I'll choose the gentleman in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try hard. I try really hard. Okay, well, sometimes I say that. Daniel Perez, Los Angeles, California. Two questions. One, when is the new campus going to be complete? Two, I know Ac Apple is a very secretive company, but are you working on electric vehicles? No. <laughs> Maybe I should have called on someone else. Can I rewind the tape? Um, <laughs> the campus is right on target. You know, this is a huge project, if, if you've seen it from some of the drones flying overhead and, and so forth. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're seeing it. This is how I get my information. Uh, we think that it will be ready for some number of people to start moving in in January. And so I'm not sure whether we'll be ready to entertain you for the annual meeting there next year at this time or not. We would obviously like to do that. I would say the probability is low. Uh, it'll probably be the following year because we'll have a lot of you know kinks to work out. It's, it's a big project. But, but largely we feel great about how it's going. And it's going to be so wonderful to get everybody in, not everybody, but many, many people back in one building again. We are in so many buildings around three or four cities, and, and we run our, we're, we have an informal company, and so uh, I think it'll be really great. And, uh, you know, Steve spent the last couple of years of his life really dedicating himself to that project, and uh, it, it, it will be the center of innovation for, for, for years to come. In terms of stuff we're working on, you know, uh, do you remember when you were a kid, and on uh, Christmas Eve, it was so exciting, you weren't sure what was going to be downstairs, <laughs> so, just, it's going to be Christmas Eve for a while. <laughs> All right. Everyone for coming out. If I didn't get to your question, please, please just drop me a mail, and I will do my utmost to answer it for you. I thank you for your support. Your encouragement always means a lot. In particular, the last couple of weeks has really meant a tremendous amount. Thank you.